Hey, Randy Joe here, or The Average Joe, and today we're going to be counting down my top 25 albums of 2023. Let's just jump into the list. From 25 to 11, I'm going to kind of breeze past them to avoid uh, talking too much. You know, I don't want to pad out the video too much here. With that being said, at number 25, we've got Magic 3 by Nos. The difference between you and I spitting a wide difference. They hate on you with me. They want me to die different. Nos returns to close out his trilogy, the Magic Trilogy in this instance, and closing out the six album collaborative run with Hit Boy. And this album overall feels like a victory lap of sorts because Nos is just as sharp as he's ever been. And the production here is, again, just absolutely gorgeous from Hit Boy as it's been in the previous five albums in this collaborative run. And overall, I think Nas does a great job showing that he is an aging rapper who still has just as much game as anybody else in the rap industry. But speaking of aging rappers, at number 24, we've got New Blue Sun by Andre 3000. Unlike Nas though, Andre 3000 has decided to forego the entire rap persona, even though he is considered one of the greatest rappers of all time, in exchange to do an entire flute album. The first half of this album is particularly fantastic, while the second half does meander a little bit. But overall I would say this is a great ambient project that will fulfill most ambient fans and will just kind of impress anybody else who hasn't delved into the genre. I think the first track here especially is particularly fantastic. At number 23, we've got 10,000 Gex by 100 Gex. That's right, the return of the incredibly controversial and divisive 100 Gex. They return with amazing hyperpop banger after banger, and even though this album is only about 26 minutes in length, every track here has something to offer, I would say, to anybody who wants something that is at least out there, experimental, and just overall uh, very bizarre. But above all else, I would say 100 Gex definitely excels in the entire feeling of being fun. Uh, this is a very just expressive, fun, joyful record that is as upbeat and manic as possible, just like their debut. At number 22, we've got Burning Desire by Mike. For fans of Earl Sweatshirt or Mavi, please check out Mike. He has uh, just been an amazing underground rapper for years now and Burning Desire is by far his best project. The entire thing has a very unique vaporwave aesthetic as well as just feeling like some sort of bizarre lost cassette tape that Mike just spits some incredibly melancholic and introspective bars over. The track Please Don't Cut My Wings, especially with Earl Sweatshirt, is definitely a highlight here. But honestly, all of the sampling on this album and the production overall is enough to just catch anybody's ear who is interested in production. At number 21, we've got Oh Monolith by Squid. I myself was not a huge Squid fan before the album's release, however, this one has definitely made me one, as this is one of the most unique post-punk records I've heard in a while, while not straying too far from the genre's roots. There are some incredible moments throughout this entire thing, especially the track Siphon Song, which feels like it is heavily inspired of Radiohead's Kid A, but overall this entire project is just seeping in this post-punk angst that I think many post-punk fans uh, love and adore. And at number 20, we've got That Feels Good by Jesse Ware. Not nearly as experimental as her last LP, What's Your Pleasure. That Feels Good is an extremely poppy, fun, and retro disco LP that sort of brings back the genre roots while at the same time revitalizing them to a modern day audience. Every track here is wonderfully produced, incredibly catchy, and by far I would say Jesse Ware's most intoxicating and accessible. With very few slow tracks here, it is just banger after banger after banger, and I highly suggest checking it out if you are interested in a neo-disco album. And number 19, we've got Zengo by Witch. I'm gonna go This Zambian rock band, aka Zam Rock Band, returns with this very 70s aesthetic while at the same time still feeling unique and refreshing to today's modern audience. 
and knowing that Witch is a band that came from the 70s that has only came back recently because of the cult following behind them really shows that they have not completely forgone their 70s production aesthetic. This thing is very psychedelic and raw and visceral while at the same time feeling kind of garage rock in its tone. It sounds lo-fi and low budget in a sense while at the same time not feeling poorly produced. It is very expertly produced in its own unique fashion. And overall every track here is at least interesting despite the fact that it is not in my language. I found the instrumentals at the very least to be incredibly engaging, especially the first track here, which I replayed constantly into the ground. Uh, I don't know how many times. At number 18, we've got The Beggar by Swans. In typical Swans fashion, this is a long LP at an hour and a half, with one track in particular being about 45 minutes. And in this runtime, Swan somehow manages not to meander on too much. Every track here feels like it is the perfect length for what it needs to say. And on top of that, I think what it is saying is by far Swan's most interesting and introspective lyrically. Michael Jira here delves a lot into his own mortality, especially considering he is, I believe, 70 at the age of recording this. And just overall looking back at his overall discography with Swans, especially with that 45 minute track like I mentioned, delving a lot into their past work. But overall this LP is just rich with thematic cohesiveness and lyrics that are by far their most poetic yet. And number 17 we've got Guts by Olivia Rodrigo. If I'm being honest, I did not expect this teenage angst-fueled album to be one that would be so engaging to someone like myself. However, I came away from this thing thoroughly impressed with the production, the themes, and the overall maturity of Olivia Rodrigo on this LP. There are some incredibly catchy pop-punk tracks on here too, such as the wildly popular Bad Idea Right, and its production there too with the, the laws in the background are just absolutely angelic as well as having some really beautiful ballads as well, such as Vampire, which, although very theatrical, still manages to stick the landing and feel just as heart-wrenching as she aimed it to be. And before I move on to the next one, I also want to say that Lacey is an incredibly delicate track that feels like a modern-day Jolene from Dolly Parton, but brought down to a modern audience. And at number 16, we've got Fanfare from Dorian Electra. Just as divisive as ever, Dorian Electra returns with their third LP, and although it is not as lyrically dense as their breakout record Flamboyant, which was one of my highest rated albums of 2019, Fanfare still manages to stick the landing in the terms of production. I would say above all else, this is an album that Dorian specifically seemed to focus on making bangers and hits and just upping the ante of the production to be as bombastic as possible. The energy from start to finish here is just super manic and just in your face, while at the same time never feeling like it is overproduced either. And Dorian here is just as crude as ever, especially with tracks like Sodom and Gomorrah being specifically about um, anal sex, and done so in an incredibly fun and passionate sense. But at the same time there are lyrics here that are very hard hitting and very much about the social awareness that we need to live in in today's political climate. At number 15 though, we've got Everything Harmony by The Lemon Twigs. If you are a fan of soft rock or easy listening rock from the 1970s, especially someone like Simon and Garfunkel or The Carpenters, then I highly recommend checking out Everything Harmony by The Lemon Twigs. This LP is just full of beautifully written, easy listening soft rock tracks that are super catchy in their choruses while never feeling like they are too campy or too cheesy for their own good. The ballads here, especially Born to be Lonely, uh, remain the standouts throughout this entire album, but even though this thing is 43 minutes, it just flies by like a blink of an eye. It is so simple and so easy on the ears, while at the same time having the songwriting expertise of a Simon and Garfunkel, I would argue. And honestly, I cannot wait to see what the Lemon Twigs does next. They're always throwing things back to these unique and interesting genres. And if they continue down this rabbit hole, they may uh, have a, a perfect album one day on their hands. But again, if you like the 70s style, check out Everything Harmony. At number 14, we've got Hell Mode by Jeff Rosenstock. Will you still 
I don't know if there is a single artist or band at the moment that has achieved the greatness in the pop punk genre as much as Jeff Rosenstock has. Every album he releases is released to critical acclaim and I could see why. Hell Mode is no short of that exception as every track here is wonderfully produced and manages to capture the very ethos of pop punk while still keeping it engaging and not just boiling it down to the typical uh, high school sucks sort of fashion. No, uh, Jeff is talking about very real issues such as the pandemic as well as mental health at whole and he does so in a very fun, engaging way. At number 13, we've got Javelin by Sufjan Stevens. Sufjan has always been a very poetic and just beautiful singer-songwriter who always captures the very essence of emotion in his music, and Javelin is no exception to the rule, as a lot of the tracks here are just very hard-hitting as he delves into themes of loss and grief and just dealing with the loss of a loved one, while at the same time speaking on topics of self-doubt and just overall mental well-being in these grieving times. And this entire album is very heavy on the folk leanings as well as the string arrangements that swell up into these beautiful orchestral arrangements that wrap the entire album up in a very cohesive, interesting, and identical way. I would say above all else, this album's greatest strength is its cohesiveness considering every track here feels very much like it is part of one large tapestry. At number 12, we've got This Is Why by Paramore. Paramore returns in a post-punk fashion with tracks here that are just incredibly in-your-face, punchy, raw, and unadulterated. It is a rather short LP at only about 36 minutes in length, and every track here, especially the front half, is just so strong in its berating of the listener, while at the same time being incredibly catchy and danceable in its tone. The back half of this record does slow things down just a little bit before punching right back in your face in the final track, but even still, those slower moments are full of very poetic and introspective lyrics that attack ideas that are very much current. And at number 11, we've got Maps by Billy Woods and Kenny Siegel. Kenny Siegel's production throughout this entire 50 minute LP is on point. There is not a single bad beat here. Seriously, I think I would say that every beat here is flawless. Um, and Billy Wood's rapping abilities here are just as sharp as they've ever been. Seriously, the double entendres, the metaphors, the analogies on display here are all very sharp and witty and clever that could be studied line for line for line if you really wanted to push it that far. I think this album is one to be deconstructed over time with every track here just offering up so much in their short one to two minute run times. And on top of that I would say the palette of genres here is quite diverse, especially in the middle half that breaks into the more horrorcore elements, uh, the parts that I particularly like the most, but this entire LP at whole is just absolutely brilliant. All right. Getting into our top 10, I will take a bit more time talking about these ones, seeing as they are my top 10 uh, of the year. These are my 10 favorite records. Uh, and without further ado, let's start off with number 10, Quaranta by Danny Brown. Danny Brown is by far one of my most favorite musicians of all time. He would probably end up somewhere in my top five musicians. And his album Atrocity Exhibition remains one of my favorite rap albums, period, point blank. I think it is a perfect record. So with that being said, I went into Quaranta pretty excited, pretty uh, anticipating it considering it took years to come out and considering it is actually the sequel to his 2011 album Triple X, one of my favorite albums of the 2010s, and Quaranta managed to deliver on pretty much all fronts. The front half of this album really brings the manic Danny Brown that so many fans have come to love and expect, with wildly inventive beats that match his very bizarre personality, kind of feeling like the first half of Triple X actually, and his signature humor of course also very much at the forefront here, while the second half of this LP is much more in his feelings and laid back in tone. We get a Danny in the second half here that we've never seen before, as he speaks on feelings of heartbreak and betrayal towards his loved one from himself, 
mind you, and speaking on his past and his own vices. He does a great job at addressing very real issues and his own very real flaws while never feeling like he is throwing himself his own pity party. He's very much aware of the uh, flaws that he has and the troubles that he's made while at the same time trying to let the listener know that uh, you should not necessarily feel bad for him, he just wants to vent out his trauma here in the second half and sort of dump it all on you. And while I could see how that could be uh, a little bit irritating to some and maybe not what people want from Danny Brown, I uh, personally love this because we've gotten so much of the crazy manic Danny Brown that you get in the first half here anyway that I would not mind a full album like the second half here that is much more in his feelings and introspective. Tracks like Tantor throw it back to his ain't it funny days in a way with a wildly proggy beat, while tracks like Bass Jam close things out in a very melancholic and sad depressive tone that, although depressing, feel bittersweet as he looks back on his past and growing up with music and the overall effect that music has had on him in his life. I think this album, although short, is very diverse in what it manages to do, and although surface level at times, it is more deep than I think we've gotten Danny in a very, very long time. Coming in at number 9, we've got My Back Was a Bridge for You to Cross by Anoni and the Johnsons. Anoni has been in the music industry for a couple of decades now, and My Back Was a Bridge for You to Cross is only the first LP that I've managed to catch uh, upon release. And I've got to say, I am glad that I did, because the subject matter that is tackled here, the transgender journey of Anoni, uh, is done so in a just beautifully compelling and unique way. The jazz and soul inspired leanings of Nina Simone come through strong on this entire LP, while the very real and raw topics of trans identity are, are very current and very meaningful, I think, in today's political climate. Especially with a track like Scapegoat on here, which is incredibly raw in its approach to the trans identity, and approaches things from a different and very dangerous angle, I would say looking at things from the perspective of a transphobe who is very much against the trans community and the song is sung from the perspective with lyrics like you are so killable it's not personal um, and also this one's a freebie for our guns as well being a very raw and in your face line that kind of gut punches the listener but for Anoni a trans person to attack this sort of topic from the perspective of a transphobe is just very interesting and a very delicate fine line to walk and it does so that it feels kind of sympathetic in a way without completely forgiving transphobes for their relief it's almost like addressing the society that has created these transphobes rather than the transphobes themselves but aside from scapegoat this entire lp is just wrought with incredibly detailed and nuanced lyrics for example the track sliver of ice as well is an incredibly poetic track tackling the overall beauty with the simple things in life inspired by a conversation with Lou Reed that Anoni had or why am I alive now delving into today's kind of climate of people wondering out of all the times you can live why now why in a time that is full of such hardness and grief the production here is just beautiful and raw and really just feels very much like it is a product of the 1960s soul scene but brought to a very modern day audience. It is an absolutely beautiful and stunning record that I highly suggest checking out if these themes of trans and identity seem very interesting or current to you. At number eight, we have Lahai from Sampha. Ways will catch you, life will catch you, love will catch you. Spirit. Unlike the throwback sound of the last soul record I was talking about, this soul record here is very much a neo soul record. It is very modern in its approach. It is very forward thinking and spacey, especially with these shimmery effects in the background sounding like they're coming straight from a spaceship. While Sampha manages to delve into themes of human connection and just the overall connectivity between person to person and what a person's experiences kind of has on them as an individual. The instrumentals here are just incredibly well produced and Sampha's vocals are just heavenly from start to finish. The thing is, Sampha has been flexing his vocals for years, whether they be on Drake Records, Kanye West Records, or Solange Records, we have seen Sampha's vocal abilities 
for for a long long time and even though his last album was in 2017 with process him returning now with la high feels like a strong and incredibly invigorating comeback whether it be the wildly popular Spirit 2.0, the punching and invigorating Dancing Circles, or the very spacey and futuristic Jonathan L. Siegel, every track here is at least interesting and dynamic enough that they stand on their own without feeling like they belong on a different LP. It all pulls together in a way that kind of brings it back to that theme of human connection and just constantly feels cohesive in its instrumentals. And at number 7, we've got 3D Country by Geese. If I'm being honest with you, from a personal standpoint, th this is a record that I just constantly keep going back to, and every time I do, I am more and more impressed with it. In fact, the first time I heard this record, I know there was a ton of buzz about it upon release, and I didn't get it. I did not understand what people were hyping this thing up for. Uh, it just, it just did not jive with me at all. But then a few months later. Um, one of the tracks here, I cannot remember which, kept playing in my head, just a small snippet from it, and I thought, I'll check it out. And boy, am I glad that I did, because upon a re-listen, I became hooked on this thing. This is all I listened to for about a week straight on repeat was this album here. Uh, it's just incredibly unique in its very post-punk and Led Zeppelin-esque throwback tone, while adding a very unique country twang twist. This record feels like a drunken cowboy is just spewing all this nonsensical sort of journeyman sense into you with his heavy Texan accent really coming on strong throughout a lot of these tracks here. Even though the singer is not, not from there, I believe they're from New York, but the country twang paired with the incredibly blues rock Led Zeppelin-esque instrumentals it is just absolutely beautiful and invigorating. You've got 2122 which kicks off this thing with this incredibly in your face instrumental and vocal delivery that just shouts at you in the first five seconds. Go to the sun, I'm taking you down to the inside. Beautiful, uh, beautiful opening. The way this thing just kicks off, it just shouts right into your face before breaking things down multiple times throughout this track into a noise rock cacophony. Or you've got 3D Country, the title track, which strips it all back to focus on the singer's sort of accented tone and has a much more traditional country sound, again, with a very bluesy sort of undertone. Undoer is very post-punk and almost post-rock in a way, with its slow building nature as it explodes in the back half. Or say Elmo closes things out in a very almost drunken stupor-esque way that feels like the listener is just breaking down along with the instrumental that feels as if it is also uh, deteriorating with you. Seriously, the, the cover art as well, um, I don't typically talk about cover art, but if you want an album that matches the cover art perfectly, I think this does it. It feels like an explosion of sounds in your face that just knocks you back, and you gotta hold on to that cowboy hat or else it will fall off. And I think Geese just, just really blew it away with this one, and I can't wait to see what they do next. I honestly don't know if they can top this, because it is such a strong record, but but, but but it's possible, it's certainly possible. And I, for one, will be waiting front row and center to hear what they do next. And at number six, we've got McKinley Dixon's beloved Paradise Jazz. You gotta say the question mark. There's a question mark in the title. How I could underestimate, son. But seriously, this thing is is also just absolutely stunning in its approach. It is short, I think only 28 minutes in length, and yet with these 20 minutes, no second is spared as the orchestral jazz rap leanings are very much the standout element of this LP. While McKinley Dixon's lyrics tackle that of racism and just the overall treatment of black people inspired by the novels, beloved Paradise and Jazz. From front to finish, you get a loose concept album coming from McKinley Dixon's experiences himself over top of these beautiful orchestral jazz rap instrumentals that feel like they are live in your ears as if you were hearing the instrumentals right in front of you. Every track here is just incredibly rich in its instrumentals as well as the lyric from McKinley Dixon himself feeling like they are just as strong and rich as one Kendrick Lamar. You've got Tyler Forever, which serves as a tribute to his lost friend Tyler. 
one he had lost in uh, Gang Violence, or Sun I Rise that has just as epic of an instrumental as the title suggests. And despite being only 28 minutes, I think McKinley Dixon takes on a quality over quantity approach, as every second here is just incredibly dense and unique and never feels like a wasted moment. At number five, we've got King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard with Petro Draconic Apocalypse, or Dawn of an Eternal Night, an annihilation of planet Earth and the beginning of Merciless Damnation. That is the full title, all 20 words of it. This is the 24th album from King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard in only about 12 years. And boy do they not mess around as this 9 track album is by far one of their best albums to date. This time around they go back to the metal sounds that they begin on their 2019 album Infest the Rat's Nest. Although in this sense it feels like a much more prog induced metal sound rather than the thrash metal sound that was on Infest the Rat's Nest. Every track here is just pummeling you with its gorgeous drum playing from calves, while the lyrics over top tell this very disruptive and chaotic tale of a uh, modern day dragon roaring through the world and just destroying planet Earth and everything in its wake as an allegory for the current climate change and pollution that we are dealing with. Which at this point is pretty typical for King Gizzard to delve into, as I think pretty much 90% of their discography is about uh, pollution. But here they do it with a, a overdose of fire and carnage and destruction through the tail of this dragon. You have the incredibly catchy witchcraft which feels reminiscent of their tracks like Rattlesnake with its repetitive witchcraft in its chorus. Or even Gila Monster which is this chanting almost cult-like experimentation that uh, really kind of goes to show how much of a cult fan base they have as the live shows with this one really do feel like you are at some sort of um, disruptive uh, I guess cult leader in a sense but by far the best track here is Dragon a almost 10 minute track that is constantly pummeling you with catchy and invigorating riffs as it fully brings to the forefront the dragon that this entire LP is encirculating around the back half of Flamethrower as well closes out this album with a very synthy inspired tone which teases gorgeously their next following album The Silver Chord. If they put out an album like this every two years they are still going to be one of the best rock bands working today if not uh, the best. And at the number four spot we've got Urapaya by George Clanton which is right here actually and also going to be here. If you like your music very uh, psychedelic and vaporwave focused, then look no further than Ooh Rap Aya. Yeah. Every track here goes into the dealings of heartbreak and identity and finding one's purpose in life through the mantra of Ooh Rap Aya, yeah, while sung and performed over gorgeous instrumentals that are quite luscious and warm and explosive in their tone. The synths underneath the very roaring guitar riffs are really driving this thing forward with every track and tracks like justify your life or the very 90s induced i Been young are by far some of george clanton's best songs written to date you also have the incredibly underrated track you hold the key and i found it which has one of the most underrated front halves of any instrumental i've heard in the entire year it is slow and delicate as it builds in this very stoner-esque dream-esque atmosphere and above all else, that is definitely the point I want to drive home with this album, is that the atmosphere is very much the key to this album, and really Clanton's music at whole, as it really throws things back to the sounds of nostalgia, and feels like one that is bringing you back to a time when you were much younger, and you woke up, and the TV was on, it was dark in your room, and you just, you don't even know where you are, you kind of feel like you're between the... 4D and 3D dimension and that really is what this music sounds like. It is very just lost in time but brought to the forefront of reality. At number three we've got Dog's Body by Model Actress. If you like your noise rock and industrial rock to be very danceable then Dog's Body is going to be the album of the year for you. 
tackling very sexual and sensual themes here. Dog's Body is one that is LGBTQ plus inclusive as it tackles the idea of the sexuality in a way that feels very raw and emotive while never feeling like it is offensive or making a mockery of it. It critiques the overall abusive sort of tone that may come with the homosexual community, especially within the somewhat violent dating scene for some, and tells the tale of an abusive relationship, but is done so, again, quite uh, delicately and danceable, surprisingly. It feels disturbed and broken up and just really dissonant, while at the same time being really catchy. And even though a lot of the tracks here are blaring and very much in your face and explosive in terms of sound, tracks like Sleepless, Divers, or Sun In are very much slow builds that are not nearly as explosive in their sound and much more delicate, focusing on the singer's very gentle vocals instead. I have never heard an album that delves into such taboo and corrupt themes, but doing it in a very uh, fun and upbeat way. At the number two spot, We've got Scaring the Hose by JPEG Mafia and Danny Brown. Like Mask, the second album to make my top 10 from Danny Brown, Scaring the Hose, is the wildly inventive collaborative effort of JPEG Mafia and Danny Brown. Two of rap's most wildly left field artists come together on this collaborative effort that showcases just how odd and eccentric these two can be. The production by JPEG Mafia is very much in your face and showcases his unique sampling abilities, sampling everything from retro Asian video game commercials to the wildly popular Milkshake song. You get a huge diverse range of samples here that feel like they are never out of their element and somehow all fit together quite cohesively despite the fact that none of them can be further away from each other. And on top of that, JPEG Mafia brings his typical political rap fare alongside Danny Brown's very weird, eccentric personality where he is quite literally laughing over some of the punchlines that he delivers here. The energy on this entire thing from front to back is just at an all-time high and you will never hear an album from these two that is this high octane from start to finish. Every track here is just fueled with high effort energy and showcases both talents from both artists in a wildly inventive way. And my number one album of the year, my favorite album to top all albums here, has to be Saved by Reverend Kristen Michael Hader. <laughs> Reverend Kristen Michael Hader, aka Lingua Ignota, is a unique individual in the fact that I have never heard an artist quite like her. Every album that she creates is so unique to herself in such an interesting and tiresome sort of venture into her psyche that I am always left amazed at her capable abilities both vocally and instrumentally. But unlike her Lingua Ignota projects, I find Save to be the most interesting and cohesive of all the albums she's put out so far. Because personally, my major gripe with her past releases was that although interesting, I was never able to listen to one of her albums from front to back more often uh, than just a handful of times. And even then, I found that the lows of each album was so low that it would overall kind of affect my overall enjoyment of the album. Even if I understood that the music was very good, it wasn't personally to my liking at all times. On her album Caligula, an album that I again very much enjoyed, I only found myself going back to the track Do You Doubt Me Traitor, simply because it was one of, and is still, one of the most heart-wrenching and powerful tracks I have ever heard in my life. But Saved, her latest release, performed under the Reverend Kristen Michael Hader name is unique to the fact that I love every single song here from front to back and I think this is just a beautifully sequenced album in, in its entirety. The way that Kristen Hader approaches production especially on this album really brings this to its unique own uh, universe because this entire album feels as if you were walking through a forest and you stumbled into an abandoned building and you found an old record sitting on an old turntable and maybe it's a little warped and warbled and there's some moss growing onto it so you hit play anyway and miraculously uh, it plays and what it plays is some very disturbed 
religious, almost cultish performances. Because every track here uh, is just that. It feels like it is a cult of lost women who are being sort of brainwashed into this very religiously heavy cult leader. And even though every track here, like I said, sounds very twisted, there is a sense of beauty in it all. A sense of belonging or a sense of being reborn or finding your own purpose within this madness. And I think by doing so kind of shows how the cult world is able to make a person who is very fragile feel very much at home and safe despite the fact that they are probably the furthest from safety they've ever been. Like this entire thing kind of feels like if you took the concept of the film Midsummer and put it into an album's worth of content. Tracks here sort of warble in and out like I mentioned the production is played with. Things just cut abruptly, uh, they start in and out, they kind of pitch down at moments, she sounds demonic in her delivery. And then there are moments where she clearly knows exactly what she needs to do for a track because instead of having the instrumentals sound rough and poorly recorded like they are on other tracks, she will hone in on her vocals and make it sound clearer and more crisp than you've ever heard so far. Really honing in and focusing on just her singing capabilities. Especially on the tracks The Poor Wayfaring Stranger or How Can I Keep From Singing, the closer here. And then again to add to the atmosphere of this cultish, very um, distinct lost media element, you have tracks like There Is Power In The Blood or Nothing But The Blood Of Jesus, which are performed and sung in a way where Kristen Hader is harmonizing with different versions of herself, adding to this idea of a cult of women who are singing together um, almost like in a circle, and they are slowly being brainwashed and brought into this world. It really adds to the overall atmosphere and ethos of the album, and kind of brings it all together in a way that makes every track here feel connected, yet separate enough that they all can stand on their own. Instrumentals range from incredibly well produced to sounding like they are just falling apart and the tape is absolutely warbled, which again shows how uh, incredibly in touch Kristen Hader is with her own art. And then on top of that, to change her name from Lingua Ignota to Reverend Kristen Michael Hader only adds further to the image of this album as being a piece of lost media, uh, along with the album cover, which feels like it is a, a thing of the past in a way. And overall, even though I don't think this album has as much replayability as a lot of the other albums on my list, it is by far the album that left me the most shocked, amazed, and just overall interested in what it had to say. I don't think I've heard a single album in my life that has left me more disturbed, more frightened, yet more in awe of its sheer beauty than Saved by, uh, by, by Reverend Kristen Michael Hader. And with that being said, this is my album of the year, it is my favorite album, and it is definitely going to be one that will remain in my mind for years to come. But that pretty much does it for my top 25 albums of the year. But uh, as always, my name is Randy Joe. If you've watched this far, I thank you. And as always, I'm signing off.